You're listening to TFM. Want to join in the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode? Join the Babel Conference, our listeners' discussion group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field, and we look forward to seeing you there. Hello and welcome to TFM's local watering hole and I am just one of your hosts here, Matthew Rushing, and I'm so excited to be back in the Continental this week. I've got to say, oh my gosh, the meals here are incredible. In fact, I feel like you could eat a meal every day of the year and not have the same thing and with me as she is always enjoying a nice bottle of wine, Christy Morris. Yes, thank you so much for joining me here at the Continental uh, for a plate of duck fat. Mm, mm, It's delectable. It, I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, fat makes everything better. Uh, You know, just uh, just think of uh, having a great juicy steak. Or Mm -hmm. ah, now I'm hungry. (laughs) (laughs) As long as there's no business on company grounds, we're good. All right. Yes. Yes. Well, we are gonna have some business here, but officially sanctioned business here at the Continental as we are talking about John Wick Chapter 2. But before we do that, of course, just a huge thank you to all you who listen and subscribe, and we really appreciate that. You know, uh, And if you're not subscribed, you know, hit the subscribe button on whenever player you're using for your podcasts. Uh, you can also uh, help us out by following us and interacting with us over on uh, social media. Follow us on Twitter at the 602 Club and we're on Instagram at the 602 Club TFM. We would love to be able to talk with you and interact with you there. Uh, you can also uh, help other people find the show. Give us a star rating and review over on Apple Podcasts. We'd you know, obviously appreciate five stars, but whatever you think we deserve. And we also read those written reviews out on the show, which is always fun. Uh, and of course, you can find us wherever podcasts are hosted. Uh, we're also on Facebook at facebook.com slash Trek of and the entire network. We've got a listeners discussion group that you can join, and it's a special place just for listeners. Uh, it's called the Babel Conference. And if you just search for that in the Facebook search field, you can join listeners from all over the world discussing all the things we do here on the network. And of course, we've got the website at trek.fm. And last but not least, we would definitely appreciate you going over to Patreon and helping support us. Uh, That's patreon.com slash trek.fm. We're below the number we'd like to be at to help support the network every single month. And so we need your help like you to go over to patreon.com slash trek.fm and be part of the team. Uh, Every little bit helps, honestly, every month. Whatever you can give makes a huge difference to us. So again, that's patreon.com slash trek.fm. Well, one of the things that I thought was really interesting, Christy, and, you know, I remember even thinking to myself, you know, does this need a sequel? Um, but mm-hmm. one, one of the the things that we get here is that this movie pretty much picks up right where we left off last time. Um, obviously, it, it feels as though John has done a little bit of healing physically uh, from his last encounter. Um, but, you know, we made the joke in, in the, the, the end of the previous movie, you know, the car has still not been recovered. And yeah. He goes to pick up his uh, 69 Ford Mustang Boss 429, which, I mean, uh, who would let that get away from you? And Mm -hmm. it turns into an incredible start to this movie. Yeah, I I love the seamless way that they really left off the first movie as, you know, he was recovering, but still alive. And then here jumps straight into him on a chase again, trying to get the guy to find out where his car is and get his car back. So I think that that was excellent planning to make the audience interested and to do another intro, you know, a cold open, like we've talked about liking before um, where it throws you right into the action. So I think it's especially starting with just the sound effects I don't know if you noticed, you hear the motorcycle long before Mm -hmm. you actually see it. Yeah, I mean, 
to me, this did feel as if they kind of took a little bit of something from the way that Bond does its films, where you have that opening. Um, and mm-hmm. unlike most Bond films, though, I you know, I, I think of just a few, like, say, GoldenEye uh, or films like that, um, where the cold open actually plays straight into what's going to happen into the rest of the movie this obviously does as well but it's not only playing into this movie it's playing into the previous movie like we said and the fact that he is going to pick up his car from the uncle of the man who stole it and right. so i i just love that uh you know we're we're really reminding you of what had come previously but we're also kicking off a new adventure and you know uh, what's interesting too is that you know him getting the car back here is like the cold open because it doesn't really play into the rest of this movie it almost is like we're actually completing the story from the first movie but it's such a great scene. I mean, it's so well shot. The action is incredible. And again, you know, we see John here using every uh, means necessary to take people out, um, which mm-hmm. is mostly just using the Mustang. Um, now, there is one thing that I did notice here is that there is a change uh, that I detect even at the beginning of this movie which is John seems even more indestructible than he did in the first movie (laughs) because he gets hit by a car here (laughs) and ends up being able to kind of not pop back up. But I mean, he feels fine. (laughs) He gets up. He keeps going. (laughs) Yeah. Which, which, you know, is one of the things to which this movie, I think, it moves him in the direction more of almost superhero uh, from the first movie. But I'd say it's still comfortable enough that we feel like John Wick is the guy that could survive it. That that he doesn't necessarily have to have superpowers or something to do that. But I like that he's not completely indestructible because they do show him get hit and get knocked down and he finds a way i i think of him more as like rocky he's just got the inner determination so much that it's like the pain is impervious to him yeah i think that's a that's definitely a good point and and it is one of those things where you know in every action movie that you watch i don't think there isn't at least one scene where you're like oh they'd be dead you know Mm -hmm. um if that actually happened to a person and so um and and that's part of i think one of the things we love about these type of movies is the suspension of disbelief and i think you're right is that in this series they do that i think pretty well um and i think that you know one of the ways that that they uh, do that is, you know, they and I think maybe this is a good time to talk about that. You know, they they supply John with a lot of new gear, which kind of yes. helps explain the ways in which these assassins survive all of this. And, you know, we give him a suit that has like Kevlar lining in it that, you know, between the the the. um layers uh you know obviously he gets tons of new guns and new knives but really it gives us a reason for why all of these people are wearing suits in the first place right is one it's it's the business right but two the fact that it's made with these specialized materials that are you know basically bulletproof is fun you know and again it allows you then to be able to suspend that disbelief which you know is really important you know like you're like oh okay i get how that can happen Mm -hmm. and that 
this would be the suits that they wear would be much more passable in the general population than like the standard bulletproof vest that's pretty thick, you know, where you can tell someone's chest is puffed out too much. (laughs) Exactly. You know, you wear a flak jacket around and people just kind of look at you weird. Yeah. I mean, go figure. But yeah, I, I love that they added that in that they focus so much in particular on the way that he gets the weapons as well. I thought was really cool that that they're trying to not just let you pass them by that. They did it disguised as a tasting. I thought was really clever. Yeah. Yes. And that he says in dessert and that's the knives. (laughs) Yes. No, I, I agree with you because too, I, I appreciated, you know, if we, have all of these people who you know have these uh, you know specialized suits and all it it also made sense why he picked out some of the guns he did especially for his scenes in Rome where you know he got that shotgun uh, and he got that um, assault rifle like an actual assault rifle Mm -hmm. which is you know uh, has rounds which would be able to pierce what they're wearing, basically, um, and be able to kill people um, with the rounds that you're using. And and I also think, too, when you know now what these suits are that these people are wearing, it, it lets you know why he's so good at what he does um, because, you know... He's the type of person he like he may stun you with a shot to the chest or whatever, but then he goes for the headshot, you know, and mm-hmm. so it and and I think so all of this new gear was also, you know, leading you to understand as well just how deadly he is because he is able to take these people on and he's better than everyone there because he's just a better shot and he's better at picking out his uh, weapon arsenal. And he's also one of the most uh, resourceful people out there when it comes to, of course, you know, they keep talking about the fact that he, you know, killed somebody with a pencil, a pencil. You want to see me make this pencil? (laughs) <laughs> you know, that's all I could think of. Uh, and he does. He disappears a pencil. So. Yeah. Well, and I'm glad you brought that up because I did want to add uh, the other thing I love about the opening as well is that they realize that for some people, it may have been a little while since they saw the first movie. And you need to be reminded of how deadly John mm-hmm. Wick is. And so I love that they have him. Um, they have Tarasov telling his man about John Wick's abilities and saying he's a man of focus, determination, sheer will. And then, and then says the pencil thing. And the guy goes, I've heard the pencil story. And he's like, yeah, because it's a big deal. (laughs) Yes, exactly. And then they actually have him do it later. Mm -hmm. So he backs it up. I a hundred percent agree with you. Um, I, I think that was really smart. Well, and then, and they also do a good job, uh, in that of just kind of reminding you about, you know, John Wick's story. So in many ways, if you hadn't seen the first movie, you could still come into this movie and kind of pick up what's going on. And, and the fact that, you know, you see that he had lost his wife and that's part of adding to the universe here is that, you know, when the crime boss Santino comes and reminds him of, you know, how he had helped him in his impossible task, uh, which enabled John to marry Helen in the first place, that's why he has this thing that we, one of the big things we add, uh, and one of the first things we add, is this idea of this marker, this blood oath, which is this unbreakable vow which is one of the two rules they have in this assassin world, which is you don't do business on continental grounds and you don't break a blood oath. Mm -hmm. You can't break the unbreakable vow, hence the name. Um, So, you know, to me, that was a a great addition to this world. And I think it's, it's also something that in many ways, it helps kind of legitimize why we're doing a second film and because 
this is entirely connected in building off of everything that we created in the first movie. And the whole crux of that movie was, you know, his, his, the, you know, dog being taken that his wife had given him after she had died. And so finding a way to kind of accentuate that part of the story and build into that, that, you know, somebody had helped him uh, with this task he had to complete. Um, and to do that, he basically has to, you know, sell his soul to the devil mm -hmm. is, I think, a great way of, of you know, adding to the universe right because especially with this kind of story you have to have a legitimate reason that makes sense for john to have to come back out of retirement again and we had it with the first movie but then at, at the end of that movie you're not really sure if they would be able to have another driver that had that high of stakes for john to go back to work again after that right so right. I do think that they worked this in well to connect to that original story and give him a reason. And also that he still doesn't want to be doing this. He realizes, oh, obviously, after his house is blown mm -hmm. up in by saying no, that he can't say no. And, right. you know, I love that moment when he's telling Winston or, you know, Ian McShane's character, that's what I did to get out he's like oh so you call this out <laughs> like yeah dude you're exactly. not out you're still in it <laughs> yes no i mean a hundred percent that's a, such a good point and i you know i i think again to me it really just it, the only thing i could I, I way i could describe it was he did make a deal with the devil yeah you know because regardless he was always going to get pulled back in somehow, mm -hmm. even if his wife was still alive. And so, yeah, this this was never. And I think it, it does help even accentuate the question from the first movie that we talked about, which is, you know, can you ever leave this type of life, you know? Mm -hmm. Or is it always going to haunt you? Is it always going to leave a mark? And, and this movie kind of... It, raises those stakes by showing just how much he had to do to try to get out. And, you know, it, it clearly is the, you know, Godfather the three. Every time I think I'm out, they keep pulling me back in. And so mm -hmm. um, that happens here. And, and you know, not only did we add to the, the rules of the world here, we learned about the blood oaths, but, I, you know, we're continuing to kind of build uh, this this universe in the sense that we we also introduce this idea that there is this high table of leaders in this assassination world. That there is this, you know, um, maybe the ultimate crime bosses, which yeah. kind of leaves you guessing because we don't meet any of them and we don't really hear anything more about them other than the fact that the reason that Santino is wanting his sister Gianna killed is because he wants her seat, uh, yep. which she is inheriting. And so that that to me is is one of those things where it's like they actually planted a seed for things that as a, a viewer of these films, now I want to know more about that because, you know, it's just teased and it seems to be kind of important. Yeah. I love that they brought this in. Um, it does add a whole other layer of mystery to the story and definitely makes me think, well, now I've got to know who all is on the high table and what do they do? And you know, like mm -hmm. what, what, what do they wear to these meetings? Right. All the important details. <laughs> of yes, course, yes. I'm the one that's going to say that uh, the cosplayer here, but, yeah, I love that. It actually even reminds me of um, other stories where we've had something similar, like Dr. Horrible's sing-along blog, where they have the mm -hmm. bad yes. horse and the yeah. evil league of evil. The evil league of evil. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. No, 100%. Uh, and and that's, that's actually a very funny reference 
to where you kind of get this idea like you know in that it's this ridiculous world where there are so many villains, right? Mm-hmm. And here, you know, obviously this is a world of assassins and, and there's this whole under level, uh, uh, an undercurrent of our world that's happening that we're just not aware of, you know? Mm-hmm. And part of that, I mean, we, we add a whole new player to, this world of assassins, which is an an actual underworld crime boss known as the Bowery King, and he's played by Lawrence Fishburne, which is great because we get a, a Matrix reunion. Yes, but he is the underground, uh, literally of N- NYC. You know, using homeless people to pose as his eyes and ears all over the city. Um, he's got homing pigeons that I guess. They carry on SIM cards, it looks like, or maybe USB drives, which is interesting. So there's that. But what did you think of his introduction, you know, to this universe? It was so cool how they did that slow build up where, you know, they have John meet the homeless man who he knows is going to be connected to the Bowery King and take him to him. He says, you know, take me to him. Tell him it's John Wick. And I love that immediately guy snaps into action. And uh, Mm -hmm. even the whole can I get a quarter bit was great. And then even when they start to show the Bowery King himself, they start with his hands and work the way the camera's way up to the face to finally reveal that it's Lawrence Fishburne. And I was like, oh, this is so good. I bet they were so happy to be back together for a movie. Um, But he he's so good at becoming a character like this. And it even reminded me of like a Batman villain, almost like mm-hmm. Penguin or something, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Good call. Yeah. He's got a lot of layers and he's got this world and, you know, it may be disgusting and weird to most people, but it's his. Well, and I, I mean, I think one of the things that he does so well is that there's an act that he has that he puts on. And then there's the whole other side of the world. I mean, and you even see that. You know, where the guys uh, and the people that are involved with, you know, posing as the homeless uh, that are his eyes and ears, you know, when they come back, you know, they there's this costume that they're putting on. There's this role that they're playing. And, you know, um, which is what makes it so beautiful is you're like that is a genius idea because i mean in in all honesty like nobody thinks twice about the homeless people that they pass on the street like that as in to what they're saying around them in many ways what they're doing around them Mm -hmm. you know you just you don't have that thought and so to have this player be introduced uh is so interesting and of course too what i it adds to the complexity of the world, you know, in, in the fact that we add this new player because, you know, he has every interest in Santino not being, you know, given a seat at the high table and that that would enlarge his territory. And, you know, as John tells him, do you really think he's going to stop where he's supposed to stop on the map? Do you, you really think yeah. he's going to let you, you know, be a rival for him in any way, shape or form here in New York if he gets this seat? No. Um, and so, that, I mean, I just thought that was great. And then I also like that he only gives, you know, John a gun with seven bullets for seven million dollars, which I was is gonna the say- price on John's head. That was so good. I even love when he first jokes about it and says, we're going to Applebee's. <laughs> yes. Yes. That was great. That was great. Like, whoo, big Which, money. <laughs> hey, man, you know, Applebee's is pretty decent. So, you know, you can get some good food there. Yeah. Um, but and, yeah, that was got a great s- dig. Yes, it was. a. It was great. No, I, I heartily agree with you. So. So with this new world that we're diving further into, um, I, you know, we, we ended up with a lot of assassins. And, and just before we kind of got to kind of two of the main people that John ends up having to face off with, like they put out the call for John Wick and it's like everybody in New York is an assassin that you didn't know about. And I was like, I don't. 
that's one place in the movie where I'm not quite sure how I felt about the idea that there are just so many assassins out there in New York City alone. That's a good point that, it, you know, it would make more sense if they were saying, oh, all over the world, people were getting the call and finding their way to where he was. But they didn't. It was like they were saying they all just hang out here in case they get a call. <laughs> <laughs> and if they have to travel, then they will. But it's probably going to mm-hmm. be here, right? So, yeah, I mean, I agree with you. That wasn't the best plot point. But then, I don't know, I guess to me, it also kind of got across that there are assassins hiding in plain sight all the time. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So too many, probably. But the idea was good. Well, at least... You know, when you think about it, it's New York, and and New York, New York is one of the biggest and most important cities in the world. So mm-hmm. it, there's a that leeway to it, but it, it just seemed a little bit funny to me that you know you get this call going out, and they just seem to be all over the place and everywhere, which was a little hysterical. But You know, I thought it was interesting that this movie gives him a couple of different people to be able to face off with and two very different types of foes. And I really enjoyed uh, Common as Cassian, who played Gianna's uh, ward, or, or, you know, she was his ward, she's his chief bodyguard. And the battle they have in the subway uh was was great as is the battle that they had all over rome where i mean they fell down all those stairs and like they would have broken every bone in their body falling down those stairs but you know and and two just the relationship that they had with each other in the sense that there is this honor among assassins if you're actually holding to basically i guess the assassin's code where there's this professional courtesy um, to which they had for one another. And I mean, he even leaves him with, you know, the knife in his chest. And he's like, you know, if you try and move it, it, it it's, it'll kill you. Um, so he's not dead. Um, he actually leaves him with the opportunity of surviving. And so to me that I, I mean, I thought that was great. I really loved their showdowns. I thought it was fantastic. Yeah, the tension building, especially with the two of them, was so good. It it really shows that there are other agents, or assassins, I guess, not agents, comparable to John Wick, possibly, out there. Um, and that clearly they've known each other before, because they seemed to have that rapport when they initially greet each other in Rome. And they're like, hey, you know, that whole back and forth of trying to assess why the other one is there was so good. And then, you know, just like a Western, the fling of the gun. Um, And then the two other fights that they have, you can really tell the effort that they both put in and can feel, like I said, the tension there between the two of them because John considered her a friend, Gianna. And so it was hard for him to go in and even do the deed in the first place. And then Cassian, especially because he's with her 24-7, as her primary guard was also very close with her. So he considers it a personal attack that he now has this vendetta against John wick. So uh, yeah, I love that even at the bar, they're both saying, yeah, this is never going to be over. (laughs) Right. Well, and you know, too, again, it's business, you know, Mm -hmm. this is the business they're in. Uh, and, so it's not personal, it's business. And and yet, like you said, there is this personal nature to it, right? Um mm-hmm. and it's uh you know, you 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 did get the great feeling that you know, she Gianna did have a relationship with John and you kind of get the sense that it could have been something, you know, uh and and you mm-hmm. definitely get that idea that her and Common have maybe, you know, been more than just bodyguard and ward um, as well, which mm-hmm. is what makes this very personal. Uh, so 
Yeah, and then, I mean, and in all honesty, John Wick is probably the most famous assassin in this world of assassins, and so it does seem like everybody knows him, respects him, or at least, you know, if they don't respect him, they think, oh, he can't be as good as he actually is, So, mm-hmm. which is, you know, you get Ruby Rose playing Ares, this um, mute security enforcer, which they never, I, do they ever say she's mute? No. Because she's using sign language, which to me, I'm like, okay, she's deaf, which didn't make any sense. So reading the fact that she's mute makes much more sense because you couldn't not be able to hear and do what she's doing. Um, there's just no way. And um, so what did you what did you think of her and especially her final showdown with john wick did it did it live up to what you wanted or were you disappointed at all so i will start by saying i thought with her initially that maybe the sign language was just a personal choice to avoid having to make any noise um that's a good point too yeah which would make sense but yeah i like your point that it, it would be impossible to be deaf and be a good assassin because you have to hear mm-hmm. people coming <laughs> right right um yeah. but it was a cool thing to add um and i appreciated having something different that you really had to pay attention to notice what exactly she was saying um mm-hmm. i liked their showdown because there was also a lot of build up to it i like that they have this almost fun house full of mirrors for them yeah. to fight in even though it's supposed to be like an art exhibit um, and, uh, you know, I think that it makes sense that she wouldn't last as long going 10 rounds with John as somebody else more experienced, mm-hmm. even though she's supposed to come across like she is. Um, I think you can tell that obviously she seems a little younger in general as a character right. yeah. than like Cassian. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you there. Um, I think, I think you rightly pinpointed the fact that this couldn't be the same type of engagement that he had with Cassian. Uh, and it is because you get that, you know, feeling she's not on the same level mm-hmm. as John in the sense of experience. And, and partly that has nothing to do with her being a woman or anything. It's age, right? You know, yeah. the, 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 the experience that comes with age makes John who he is. Uh, and so absolutely. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I thought she had a great kind of rapport with John in the sense of their back and forth. I love when you realize that John understands sign language, yeah. you know, and, and he signs back to her, which is great. Um, and so that was really fun. And, you know, it, it's one of those ways in which the movie gives you a a taste of just all the skills that John has kind of picked up over the years, um, which I thought was great as well. Um, so Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, this movie did give you some really good assassins for him to be able to face off with and... In many ways, you know, the action is just bigger in this movie, which is usually what happens in a sequel anyway. But I mean, when you have the the massive gun battle that we have that rages all over Rome and then running throughout all of New York City, you know, and, and having been to some of those places in New York City, um, like in front of the, I think it's in front of the Opera House because, or at the museum right there where the um, fountain is. That, you know, him and Common are shooting each other through mm-hmm. uh, the the subways that, you know, <laughs> they're shooting each other. And nobody is realizing was they're using the silencers. I mean, like the I, the action in this movie, the same as the first. It's so well shot and it's so well choreographed and they've done such a good job. And not only that, but, you know, we praised Keanu in the first movie, but he's even better in the sense of. Just how skilled he has become with the firearms. Because there's that scene where he checks the gun with one hand. uh, And it's just... 
the amount of practice that this guy has put into the work that he's doing to to look as proficient as he comes across on screen is bar none. Like it's it's amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he did an incredible amount of training, especially for this sequel. He actually did um, not only jujitsu and other martial arts training, even more in depth with um, these guys that are kind of famous for that called the Machado Brothers. You should look up their video on YouTube with him, by the way, John Wick 2 behind the scenes with them. It's really good. Um, He learned how to do all of the stunts himself and was actually the one in all of the scenes throwing guys over his shoulder or grappling with them on the ground. It was really Keanu doing it and also making sure that he did it safely because obviously you're doing all that stuff. It is also a dance and you don't want anyone to oh, actually yeah. get hurt. <laughs> um, well, and even at this point, I mean, Keanu's an older guy, too. Yeah, he was 50. When he was training for this. And then he also went to a shooting ranch and learned from one of the top um, marksmen in the world how to do, I think they call it three gun challenges, where it's a Mm. um, pistol, a rifle and a shotgun. And you have to quickly alternate between the three and have moving as well as stationary targets close and far away. I mean, that right there is a lot to accomplish all at once. And then he had to do it over and over and over again till it was muscle memory, they said. So he even said he was amazed at how much he was able to do, but really enjoyed learning how to make it look natural for the movie. You're 100 percent right in the in the way in which, you know, especially that scene in Rome where he is going through the different guns and having to alternate between the ones uh, that he's using because one jams or something else and he has to pull out the pistol or, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. and then he's also trying to load the shotgun. I, all of that's phenomenal. And and I mean, but it, just this action at the, I mean, when I, I think of that, that scene in Rome where they, they, you know, fall down the stairs and everything like all of that. I mean, just all of this looks so real and visceral that you do just kind of like, Ooh, that's got to hurt. You know, it, it's, yeah. it's really fantastic. And so. hitting people with cars as well. Yes. Yes. To add that back in that happened multiple times and they said it was intentional to make this movie hurt more and i was like well it does (laughs) yes it does i mean seriously it really does uh look like it's one of the most painful things that anybody's going through and side note speaking of action i mean it's not as much of an action scene obviously but just talking about making it hurt more the way Mm -hmm. gianna dies is painful you yeah, remember yeah. because she does oh, it yeah. to herself yeah. and it just yeah. i mean it's like you get it and it's supposed to kind of be this poetic death um where she almost even kind of looks like an angel as she's splayed out in the tub um with the the blood coming out and everything but it's also really sad because you're like mm-hmm. she just already knows she has no way out yeah yep but well, it's still and gross. <laughs> no, 100%. And in that too, you know, as she says, you know, I will go my way. You know, I mm-hmm. live my life my way. I'll go my way. And, you know, and so, but no, I, 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 um, I don't really do well personally with people cutting themselves or getting cut and everything. Yeah. So those are not scenes I can watch very well. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, but and so to me, I, I kind of like, oh, I'm one of those people, I'll put my hand halfway so on the screen so I can't see somebody being cut um, yeah. like that. It just, eh. mm-hmm. anyway. Um, so one of the things that we do with the film is that we leave John excommunicado because he's broken one of the two laws of the assassin world. And now he and his dog are are on the run. And so I'm kind of wondering, you know, how you felt about them leaving the movie this way. And, you know, I think we all like realized at this point, yeah, there's got to at least be a part three because we have to do something with this character at this point. Mm-hmm. 
Well, and I like that first and foremost, usually you see Winston or somebody else with the Continental able to get John Wick out of situations. But I like that this time he says directly to John's face, there is nothing I can do for you this time. I told you just Mm -hmm. walk away. You knew what you were doing and you did it anyway. Now, all of us know that Santino is doing exactly that intentionally by saying, I could stay here a long time, meaning I'll just never leave the Continental so you can't kill me. Ha ha ha. But John was like, I'm ending it. I don't care anymore. I've, I have to do something. So he did know the consequences and still was trying to figure out if Winston could get him out of it. And it wasn't going to happen. So I love that they brought it to this point and that you're wondering at, as the credits come if John is going to make it. You know, I like that they also even have him starting to pick up speed and he's running faster and faster as he's realizing time is running out. <laughs> no, I I like what you said there. Uh, you know, this idea of, of Santino, you know, basically challenging him. Uh, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and John's like, I'll play your game, you rogue, you know, Uh, which is, I, I'm, I'm done with this, you know, I'm done with you. And so I really like that this now gives us an opportunity as we move into another film, you know, that we'll have the third film. And then of course they're going to have a fourth film because that comes out next year Two be able to explore this world in even more depth because, you know, we've had all of these things teased, you know, you know, what happens when you go excommunicado. We've had the idea of this high table, you know, we've had uh, some ideas of, you know, like who John Wick is and where he comes from uh, and all of that. And so, you know, it's it it's it's an interesting question then where by doing this we're catapulting you into the opportunity to then be able to hopefully answer some of those questions, you know. Um obviously even just thinking of the fact that you know, he's got these interesting tattoos on his back and everything like that, yeah. you know. And so all of that we're going to we're going to be able to kind of dig into because, you know, it it's not just going to be the same thing where, you know, either John is sent after somebody or whatever. Now John is the one being hunted. And um I think, you know, that gives you the opportunity to just not hopefully repeat what we've done before which is good because that's not what you want, which is also, I think one of the things that this movie was able to do, which is not just feel like the same movie we saw last time. Right. Um, And that's important when you're doing this. So that'll be very interesting as we look towards the third movie to see if it does the same thing. But I'm really interested, you know, where you kind of fall down then ratings wise with this second one, is it as high as the first one? Was, was there anything then that that does kind of bring your rating down at all? So I will say I was incredibly impressed with this movie. I can tell, especially how much extra work they put in to the action, to the fighting, shooting, adding more to the lore of the world. I think that they've really pulled me in to now I'm ready for another movie because I have some unanswered questions. Whereas the first one and this one, I think could each stand on their own if they needed to, they still work as a cohesive unit. So I am really excited to see where they could take the story next. And I end up at a four and a half out of five markers because that felt so cool and even almost like a Pirates mm-hmm. of the Caribbean thing or something, you know, it's yeah. very old world. Um, I enjoyed it so much. I thought the music was really good, very memorable. I feel like we kind of have a theme for John now. Mm-hmm. Um, and especially in the scenes where they introduce Gianna, 
I love how it feels very ethereal and kind of creepy electronica vibe. So, yeah, yeah I, I loved it. What about you? Yeah, I think, you know, for me, this movie, uh, you know, when I looked back, I had given it a three and a half out of mm. five. And I think rewatching it, you know, and so close to the first one that I think this movie does a lot of what the first movie is able to do. Um, the one thing that you end up with this movie and the, and where I couldn't give it a four and a half out of five, I'll give it a four out of five is because there is, it it's not as groundbreaking as the first one because the first one already did a lot of the groundbreaking stuff. I think mm-hmm. what they did is they just kind of added to the level of what they were doing, but it still doesn't quite have that almost perfection feel that the first one does. Mm-hmm. Um, and I still very much enjoy this movie, and I think it's a, a good action movie. I think it is a good follow-up to the first film. And I think, like you said, it also does leave me with some interesting questions for the possibility of a third, which is great which, because we're going to get a third. And then, of course, we're going to get it a fourth uh, mm-hmm. next year. So it's going to be fun to kind of see, okay, how do we feel about that third one, especially as we look towards the fourth one uh, that we know is coming and that's you know, I'm I'm ready for it at this point because it's also just been delayed, which is annoying mm-hmm. uh, for so long. So, with that, Christy, I'm very excited to see uh, what you want to recommend everybody this week. So, my recommendation this week is a little bit of a lighter note. Uh, I chose to go with something that I just have been really enjoying on YouTube, actually. Um, so, for anyone out there actually looking to do some interior decorating or just if you're a guy wanting to kind of remodel your space, there is a really great interior designer that is has made her work very accessible by even doing virtual makeovers um, named Alexandra Gator, G-A-T-E-R. Uh, she's actually Canadian, but she travels all over. And she even did a series specializing in tiny studio apartment makeovers. Oh, um, nice. She does some really cool stuff and has taught me some tricks and um, also taught me about a great platform called Milanote, where you can import any pictures of items you want to try and fit together in a room and see how they look first. So highly recommend checking out Alexandra Gator on YouTube and possibly using her as your interior designer if you need some help. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Well, I'm going to recommend uh, my wife and I went to the movies this last weekend together and for the first time in a long time actually saw a romantic comedy together Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, George Clooney and Julia Roberts are back on the big screen with Ticket to Paradise and we enjoyed it. It's fun and cute and I I thought I really enjoyed the message of the film, which was really interesting to see, uh, which was also quite surprising uh and so very much would recommend anybody going to check out ticket to paradise especially if you know you have a sweetheart you want to take a a movie to uh this is definitely a good one to be able to do that with to just be able to have a good time at the movies uh, and enjoy a film together i highly recommend going to check out ticket to paradise but you know christy maybe people wanted to catch up with you and see what else you've got going on these days or maybe they just want to talk to you about what's going on where can they find you of course you can find me on instagram and twitter at bespin bell and in the babel conference on facebook and when i'm not here i was previously on a finished show i did with my friends amanda and Teresa called sabers and spells on the skywalking through neverland network called skynet And so I hope you'll check that out as well. Um, But what about you? Well, uh, of course, you could find me all over the place on social media under the name Matt Rushing 2 Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd, Vero, all of those places you can find me. Uh, Of course, you can also uh, find me uh, here on the network doing a bunch of different shows. Uh, I've got Literary Track about the books and comics of Star Trek, The Orb about Star Trek Deep Space Nine. War 5 about Star Trek Enterprise, 
Saddle Up about Star Trek Strange New Worlds, and The Artificial Tango is about Star Trek Picard. Over on the Nerd Party Network, there are two shows. One is a completed show, and I did that with Drea Kaufman. We talked about every single chapter of Harry Potter, but we did that one chapter at a time. That's called Owl Post. And then last but not least, the great John Mills and I talk about Star Wars, and we do that on Aggressive Negotiations. But thank you so much for joining us. And y'all come back now, you hear? Thank you.